Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this Brennan Center for Justice event. Uh, my name is Elias Yusuf. I'm a research analyst with the Stimson Center's Conventional Defense Program, and it is my distinct pleasure to act as the moderator for today's discussion. We are so excited to have you joining us today. Um, but before we get started, I'll just go through a few of the housekeeping notes before uh, we kick off. Um, first, we will leave time for questions at the end of this discussion. Uh, if you have questions that you'd like to ask, and we certainly encourage you to do so, please feel free to add them via the YouTube and Facebook chat. We will use those questions to inform our Q&A after we hear from our panelists. Uh, second, and I think this goes without saying, but civility is important to all of us. Uh, those who post rude or intemperate language in our message streams here on YouTube and Facebook uh, will be removed from the conversation, though I'm sure we have uh, nothing to worry about. Um, and as a reminder, we will provide live closed captioning throughout the event. Uh, finally, for those seeking CLE credit for this event, uh, we will flash a unique code on the bottom of the screen during the program. So make sure to write it down. You can find the link to the attorney affirmation form in the YouTube description box uh, and also in the event chat. Uh, email CLE at brennan.law.nyu.edu if you have any questions about the credit. Uh, but with that out of the way, for those of you joining us for the first time, the, the Brennan Center is a nonpartisan law policy institute that works to repair, revitalize, and when necessary, defend our systems of democracy and justice. It's a really incredible institution, and I'm very grateful to our hosts for convening us here today. Uh, but with that, let's turn to our program this afternoon, Secret War. Uh, as many of you will remember, about five years ago, a team of American and Nigerian soldiers were ambushed outside of Tonga Tongo, a small village in Niger near the border with Mali. Uh, the team tragically took casualties. Eight were killed, including four Americans, and the incident set off a media firestorm. As many of you will remember, Senator John McCain, who was then the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, accused the Trump administration of withholding information on how the military was operating in Niger. Uh, his Democratic counterpart, Senator Jack Reed, uh, blamed a lack of strategy and communication on the military's role in Niger and around the globe more generally. Uh, but for years, Congress and the public asked, what were American soldiers doing in Niger? Where else are they undertaking risky and potentially lethal operations? And vitally, are these operations even legal? All very important and valid questions. Uh, but really, the Tonga Tonga ambush is an example of the dangerous lack of transparency surrounding the Department of Defense's use of its security cooperation authorities. Uh, provisions of law that allow American forces to work with and operate through foreign militaries and paramilitaries. The same authorities under which U.S. forces were operating in Niger have been used across Africa and Asia, at times leading to combat that Congress has clearly not authorized. Uh, learns about after the fact, and in some cases doesn't learn about at all. Uh, so that's why we're here today. Today's panel will explore the risks posed by security cooperation, as well as the current shortfalls in congressional and public oversight. Uh, these issues are also discussed in depth in the Brennan Center's recent report, Secret War, how the U.S. uses partnerships and proxy forces to wage war under the radar, available on the Brennan Center's website. If you have not uh, found and read this report, I highly encourage you to do so. It's an excellent piece of research. Uh, I am also thrilled to be joined by a fantastic panel of experts for this afternoon's discussion, all of whom are experts on Department of Defense-led security cooperation and, and constitutional war powers. Um, first, I'll introduce Catherine uh, Ebright, uh, who is a counsel with the Brennan Center for Justice and the author of the Brennan Center's recent report on security cooperation, Secret War. Uh, I'll also be joined by Wesley Morgan, who is uh, the journalist who first uncovered the Department of Defense's 127E surrogate force program, which I'm sure we'll hear a lot about during the discussion. He is also the author of The Hardest Place, The American Military Adrift in Afghanistan's Patch Valley, which sits proudly on the bookshelf behind me. And lastly, but not least, uh, Ona Hathaway, who is a professor of law at Yale Law School and who specializes in international and foreign relations law. Anyone who's worked in this field uh, will be familiar with her great work. Uh, so with our panelists now joining us, uh, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and kick off our discussion with some questions for um, our panelists uh, before we turn to the audience. And I think the best place to start would be around these legal authorities. So, so Catherine, I wonder if you can walk us through and give us an overview uh, of some of the most noteworthy security cooperation authorities that you speak to during your report. 
Yeah, thanks, Elias. Uh, in the report, I discussed three of the Department of Defense's broadest and arguably most concerning security cooperation authorities. To take those in turn, uh, first, there's Section 333 of Title 10 of the U.S. Code. We're going to refer to that as the Triple Three Authority. Second, there's Section 127E of Title 10. We're going to refer to that as 127 ECHO. And then third, uh, and finally, there's Section 1202 of the 2018 National Defense Authorization Act, uh, which has not been codified. Uh, that's just the 1202 authority. Um, and as viewers, you may be wondering, what do all of these numbers mean? So the triple three authority to start is the Global Train and Equip Authority. Um, it's a non-operational authority, but it does give the Department of Defense broad discretion in choosing foreign militaries to train and give military equipment to. Uh, these triple three activities are supposed to take place on a base. They're not supposed to involve real world missions. Uh, but as I discuss in the report, triple uh, three nevertheless can result in combat, depending on the partners that DOD chooses, where DOD puts its bases. Um, if, for instance, DOD chooses partners who are engaged in their own local or regional conflicts, or, or if it puts its bases next to where those partners are themselves actively involved in hostilities, US forces can then quite predictably be pulled into those conflicts. And, and we see that happening today and, and historically in Somalia, uh, where US forces on a fairly regular basis now uh, have been launching airstrikes and so-called collective self-defense of the Danab Brigade, uh, which is a part of the Somali military that DOD actually helped to build through tens of millions of dollars in triple three funding. Um, so moving then to the second authority, uh, 127 ECHO is DOD's authority for creating counterterrorism surrogates. Uh, just think back to how the CIA used proxy forces in Latin America and in Asia during the Cold War, um, except for DOD. By its text, 127 ECHO allows U.S. forces to provide, quote, support uh, to foreign militaries, paramil uh, paramilitaries, and even private individuals who are in turn supporting uh, U.S. operations. And, and what that may mean in practice, Wes will speak to that, I'm sure, in a little bit. Um, what that could mean in practice is paying foreign partners uh, to do operations, including combat operations, on U.S. forces' behalf or alongside of U.S. forces. Um, but to be very, very clear, 127 ECHO is not itself an authorization for operations. It's simply a tool for conducting authorization or conducting operations uh, that instead, to the extent that they involve combat, should be based on an authorization for use of military force like the 2001 AUMF or the 2002 Iraq War AUMF uh, or on constitutional self-defense. Um, but one of the things that I flesh out in the report uh, is that I have concerns that 127 ECHO has at times been used as a freestanding authority as though it were an authorization for combat. I'm also deeply concerned that it's been used to implement bad and expansive interpretations of the 2001 AUMF or of constitutional self-defense in ways that because these programs are being run by, with, and through partners aren't transparent to Congress. Um, and then the last authority, again, shifting to 1202, um, is a more recent authority that's actually modeled on 127 ECHO. Uh, and 1202 is for, quote, irregular warfare. That's, that's quite vague as a term. Um, but if you look at how DOD officials are speaking about the 1202 authority, it becomes clear that it was sought to counter state actors like Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. And you know, considering how 127 ECHO has been used at times for combat with a sort of dodgy legal foundation, uh, that should raise some, some flags, red flags in the 1202 context. Um, and, and in fact, DOD officials have more or less acknowledged on, on the public record that we've run at least one 1202 program in Ukraine uh, to counter Russian threats. However, through my interviews, um, I've also learned that all 1202 programs to date have been uh, non-combat in nature or, or non-kinetic. They've supported information or intelligence operations. Um, but I want to emphasize that given the breadth of 1202 and given what we know about how 127 ECHO has been used, it seems like little other than good judgment prevents 1202 from being used kinetically uh, to target military objects uh, objectives. Thanks, Catherine. That's a really, uh, it's a great overview to get us started and I think leads really nicely into my next question, uh, which is 
what does this look like in practice? Obviously, we know counterterrorism programs have been run across Africa and Asia. As Catherine just mentioned, we've heard about a 1202 program in Ukraine. Um, so, Wes, you've been uh, at the forefront of the efforts to uh, shed some light on these programs, explain them to the public. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about uh, how these programs are run and, and what it looks like when the rubber hits the road. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it, it, Catherine described kind of the differences uh, among the three authorities. I'll, I'll try and break down the differences in how the authorities have been used. I understand there's a separate question about, you know, how might they be used in the future? Um, but, you know, I'm a journalist. I describe my focus is, is on, you know, how they have been used in the past, how they are used now. Um, you know, how I first came to this was in reporting on the aftermath of the Tongo Tongo incident um, that you mentioned, Elias, in, in 2017. I'm trying to figure out what had happened there. And what we learned was that essentially um, both a Green Beret team doing a 127 Echo surrogate mission and a separate Green Beret team doing a more standard triple three advise and assist mission had kind of been involved in this episode in different ways. Um, and, and that became kind of a lens for trying to trying to, you know, pull these threads apart and figure out what these authorities are being used for. Um, so as Catherine did, I'm going to make a distinction here between, on the one hand, um, forces that the U.S. military advised and assists and supports, but typically doesn't directly pay and typically doesn't have any type of official control over by the military's definition of control. Uh, and on the other hand, forces that the U.S. military pays and has what the special operations forces guys that I interview who do these missions uh, typically describe as operational control or OPCON, to use kind of a, a military term of art that's, you know, very common in, in military lingo. Um, the first type of forces, uh, the military calls them partners, um, and that describes how support is under Section 333 is supposed to work, uh, which is by far the largest of these funding sources and the one that's used in the most places. Uh, the idea is that this is for situations where U.S. and host country interests in the security er arena align. Um, U.S. advisors help the host country's military execute the host country government's counterinsurgency or counterterrorism operations or whatever type of operations, providing them with training and equipment. Um, and in the war zones where many, but not all of these happen, sometimes going out on missions with them or, you know, exercise, training exercises outside of base, but also actual missions outside of base to sort of train and advise them during those missions. Uh, and, and sometimes calling in airstrikes on, on their behalf under this collective self, self-defense um, that, that Catherine talked about. The military calls the second type of forces, the 127 Echo and 1202 ones, surrogates. Um, 1202, 127 Echo, they provide the funding for U.S. Special Operations Forces like Green Berets, Navy SEALs, Marine Raiders uh, to pay and control regular or irregular local forces and give them orders to execute U.S. missions. Um, 127 Echo is for counterterrorism, so think Africa and the Middle East, uh, you know, countries that are fighting Al-Qaeda or ISIS-aligned insurgencies uh, that the U.S. might have its own national security interest uh, in. Um, you know, Somalia, Tunisia, Niger in Africa, Yemen and Lebanon and Iraq in the Middle East, uh, and of course, Afghanistan, which was where 127 Echo kind of originated and where some of its largest programs have been run uh, over the years. But that's to name a few of the about 20 countries. Um, you know, 1202 has been used in a much more limited way in Europe for things like information operations, surreptitious reconnaissance. Um, I have an article coming out about 1202, so I'm kind of limited in, in what I can say about that, um, but I'm just going to sort of consider it separately from, from 127 Echo and 333, uh, because even though 1202, the authority is patterned off 127 Echo, um, in many ways, 127 Echo and 333 look much more like one another in that they're used in these, in these you know, active conflict zones than, than 1202 does. Um, but for, for surrogate missions under 127 Echo and 1202, the terms of a classified agreement between the host government and DOD, which the U.S. ambassador or chief of mission also signs off on, um, the U.S. can move these guys around. It can send them on missions with very quick turnaround based on sensitive U.S. intelligence that you might not want to share with the host country. Um, and U.S. advisors can give them battlefield instructions that they must follow or else face consequences of the kind of, you know, being kicked out of the program and not being paid that big U.S. stipend anymore. So that's a, that's a surrogate force. Um, now, as far as the risks to U.S. forces, um, again, I'm going to set aside Section 1202 for a minute because it's sort of so different. It hasn't been combat type stuff. Um, but with either 333 or 127 Echo, either partner forces or surrogate forces, U.S. Soft, US special operations personnel may just be doing training on a safe base somewhere, really just being inside the wire trainers, not even advisors. Or they may go along on missions and potentially be calling in airstrikes when their advisees come under fire or when they themselves come under fire or even kind of getting into the fray themselves in some circumstances. 
because you know when they do go on missions, uh, U.S. Special Operations Advisors, they're supposed to kind of hang back behind cover during an assault at what they call the last covered and concealed position, um, which is a a term from Afghanistan that sometimes doesn't make a lot of sense in big flat areas of desert or scrubland in the Sahel or Somalia. Um, But, you know, they're not supposed to be among the first guys in the target on a raid, um, depending on the rules in a particular country. And and, and from that offset position, they can call in airstrikes on behalf of their partners or surrogates in countries where that's allowed and where the U.S. has armed aircraft. Uh, And they can give them advice or instructions based on live overhead surveillance footage or intercepted enemy communications if those things are available. Um, And also from that kind of offset position, if things go south... Uh, they can kind of dive into the fray and bail out their local forces and get things under control. If, for instance, a partner force gets pinned down or starts to take a bunch of casualties um, or they encounter something that requires specialized assistance that the advisors can offer, like if there's a house bomb, you know, a, a target house that insurgents have booby-trapped with explosives, something like that. Now, you know, if I can talk just briefly about sort of what these things are used for, um, you know, surrogate forces are used for a range of things, and so are partner forces. Uh, they range from, you know, at one end of the spectrum, there was a, a longstanding 127 Echo program in Afghanistan um, that placed uh, highly trained Afghan explosive ordnance disposal technicians alongside American and other Afghan forces um, to, you know, to sort of help them out on their missions with IEDs. Um, kind of in the middle of the spectrum, you'd see surrogate units used for Uh, quieter, less combat-oriented tasks, uh, you know, reconnaissance going out and blending in in a way that U.S. special operators are not able to, to scout out targets, and then to call call in somebody else to then fly in and execute the combat raid, whether that's a larger host nation unit or an overt U.S. military combat force uh, or an airstrike. And then at kind of the far end of the spectrum that we saw in Niger and we've seen in uh, with another unit in Somalia, um, you have U.S. Special Operations Forces who send their 127 Echo surrogates out on combat missions to kill or capture insurgents in combat raids. Uh, again, Niger, Somalia. Uh, and, and sometimes that's because a particular 127 Echo program was designed for that. That was always its purpose. And in other cases, it's because kind of a mission creep has set in. And a surrogate unit that was originally used for clandestine reconnaissance by one group of Green Berets winds up being used for combat raids by a later group of Green Berets, um, which is you know what happened in Niger. Um, you know, there's a million you know, permutations of kind of how trainers and advisors and handlers are authorized to do in different countries. Um, but in places where, you know, in countries that are at war with an insurgency, you know, all of these missions are subject to the fact that the enemy gets a vote. U.S. and friendly forces are not always the ones who initiate combat. You know, sometimes the enemy gets the jump on you and attacks you and you have to defend yourself even when you were not doing a raid or a kill capture mission. You know, you were a triple three partner force doing a meet and greet or a scouting mission, which is what happened at Tongo Tongo. Um, and that's kind of a risk that is built into any type of, of advisory mission in, in, in a conflict zone. Um, even if you only have trainers who stay on base, you know, bases get shelled and rocketed and attacked by suicide bombers and so on. And U.S. trainers and advisors can get hurt or killed that way, uh, as has happened in, in Malia and Kenya. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. No, thanks, Russ. That's really excellent. And I think really uh, nicely illustrates sort of the blurry lines that um, that Catherine talked about, which, of course, leads uh, nicely to the next question. Um around what these legal implications are. Obviously, um, you know, if our partners are conducting uh, killer capture missions, uh, security sweeps, what have you, uh, it can look like the United States is not meaningfully involved, right, from a, from a bird's eye view. But as, as Wes just talked about, that isn't always the case. Oh, no, I wonder if you can talk about how these looks may deceive us a little bit here. Yeah, um, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think both Catherine and Wes have, have covered for us nicely how Um, This idea that when we're dealing with partnered operations, that somehow the United States is not directly involved is just a myth. Um, U.S. is extraordinarily involved, not just in funding and providing support and assistance and advice and intelligence and all the rest of that, but also sometimes with people on the ground whose lives can be at risk. Um, And so the U.S. is extremely involved. And and that, of course, creates all kinds of legal liability, um, potentially under international law. So um, there are two kind of broad bodies of law that would be applicable here. One is called the Law of State Responsibility, and the other is the Geneva Conventions. So the Law of State Responsibility um, uh, basically provides that if you're working directly with other forces, so the precise rule um, depends on whether you're working with partner non-state forces or state forces. But in either case, you can be held responsible if they engage in internationally wrongful acts. So they engage in, uh, you know, they kill civilians or they engage in torture and you've been providing support and assistance to 
uh, these forces, um, or they engage in a non-proportional strike, or they take out an entire village um, uh, rather than actually going after combatants. That can create legal liability for the United States uh, because that the, the United States can be responsible for the actions that these partner forces take, um, particularly if we're um, engaging, particularly if they're surrogate forces, certainly. But even these partnered operations, if we're engaging in assistance, aid and assistance to state partner forces, um, and we um, have knowledge that they've engaged in internationally wrongful acts, the United States can be legally responsible for the actions that they've undertaken. And then the other body of law is the Geneva Convention. So under the Geneva Conventions, um, uh, common article one of the Geneva Conventions says that states basically not only have to follow the Geneva Conventions themselves, so they not only have to abide by the rules themselves, but they have to ensure uh, respect for the conventions. And that means that they not only have to abide by the rules, but they have to ensure that their partnered forces, certainly their surrogate forces, are abiding by the rules under the Geneva Convention. So if they engage in a violation, they, for instance, kill civilians, uh, then that is not only a failure um, to ensure respect to the convention, but by failing to ensure respect to the convention, the U.S. is itself violating the convention because the U.S. has those obligations under the Geneva Convention to ensure respect. So this can really get the U.S. into some serious legal trouble. Thanks, Ona. And I wonder just as a, as a brief follow-up, um, I wonder what you could, if you can just talk very briefly about um, how the executive branch um, can work with Congress or if it's supposed to work with Congress to go ahead and undertake these missions by with and through partners and what legal uh, constraints might exist therein. Yeah, I think that the the truth is that um, most of this uh, does have to be reported. For instance, 127E does have a reporting requirement to Congress, uh, to the Armed Services Committees. But in reality, um, it's not clear that Congress really fully understands what's happening. So we saw this in the Niger incident that was already mentioned, where senators were, um, you know, going to the press and saying, we had no idea that there were forces in Niger. We had no idea that these operations were underway. Um, mm. And in fact, the House Foreign Affairs Committee had never been briefed on this. As far as we know, Senate Foreign Relations Committee had never been briefed. The Armed Services Committees were supposed to have been briefed under 127E, uh, but it's not clear how much they're tracking this. And um, as Catherine said at the outset, this is not an authority to engage in military operations. It is a, it is a authority to provide support and assistance, but it is not supposed to be a substitute for Congress authorizing use of military force. And it does seem that on occasion, the de Defense Department may be treating it inappropriately as if it's sort of a substitute for either an AUMF or um, other authority um, from uh, from Congress. And just one thing to add there, I, I think that um, there's a piece of this that I think Catherine kind of alluded to, which is we have these partnered operations that were providing the support um, and assistance to a variety of different forces. And there has been this growth um, of reference to self-defense and collective self-defense by U.S. Uh, forces when they're explaining what happened, you know, often the sort of press releases reference collective self-defense. And this has been growing substantially and this idea that we can engage in collective self-defense of partnered forces when they're engaging in missions where we're providing support um, has not really been fully vetted by Congress. And that's something I really think deserves a lot more careful attention by political actors than, than it's received. Yeah, thanks, Ona. I think that's, uh, I, I, let's talk a little bit more about Congress then. Catherine, I'm wondering, um, you know, obviously Congress uh, is responsible for declaring war, for funding the military, regulating the military. Is there a theoretical role that Congress is supposed to have in formulating 333, 127 ECHO, and 1202 programs, or, or not, not really? Well, under the law and, and in general, Congress has no formal role in designing these programs, notwithstanding the fact that the Constitution says that the you know, branch of government responsible for declaring war, for regulating the military, again, as you suggested, is Congress. Um, <laughs> there's no law that requires Congress to sign off on a 333 program, 127 ECHO program, or 1202 program. No law that says you have to talk to Congress before you can decide uh, that you're going to exercise unit or collective self-defense. Um, 
for 333 and 1202 programs specifically, there are certain congressional committees that are entitled to roughly two weeks advance notice of DOD's intent to start a program. Uh, for 127 ECHO programs, however, uh, Congress, certain committees in Congress can be informed of those programs, those activities actually after the fact. Um, that said, you know, there are a handful of congressional staffers or lawmakers who in the triple three, 127 ECHO and 1202 contexts, um, just the handful of people who are read in, who can have some sort of informal role in designing programs. Uh, so when DOD does decide to provide uh, or does in accordance with the law provide advance notice to congressional committees, uh, those staffers or lawmakers with notice can push back. Um, but there's actually nothing that requires DOD to acknowledge the pushback or to make changes based on what the lawmakers say. There's no you know, prior approval requirement. Um, and, and this brings us back to the point that I initially made when I was introducing the authorities, which is that 333, 127 ECHO and 12 r 2 are very broad. Um, they allow DOD tremendous discretion, and we know that Congress can enact far narrower, geographically limited, temporally limited authorities um, that would allow it to hold the reins on when and where security cooperation takes place, when and where we're exposing U.S. forces to the risk that maybe they're going to encounter their partner's adversaries. Um, and although I said in general Congress has no formal role with respect to these security cooperation programs, there is one exception, which is uh, Congress in the past has at times specifically legislated, we want security cooperation programs through say triple three uh, to take place in Southeast Asia to train our partner forces on cybersecurity, right? And, and so in those contexts, you can see Congress legislating saying like, this is how we want security cooperation to happen through these programs. And so in, in that narrow context, Congress does get the sort of yes, no um, by law. But in other contexts, it's really an informal procedure uh, where you have to hope that giving Congress notice, giving certain lawmakers and staffers in Congress notice is going to be sufficient uh, to prevent imprudent programs from, from moving forward without clear congressional knowledge or, or approval. Right. I mean, it sounds as though Congress has a pretty tenuous grasp of these programs once they've once they've started. So I wonder, um, I know all of you to some degree have engaged with congressional offices, lawmakers um, on some of these very questions, and I'm sure have presented to them some of the issues with this lack of, of oversight. Um, I wonder what those conversations are like. Uh, has the has Congress become a better at understanding how these programs are working as opposed to before the Tonga Tonga incident? Catherine, I'll start with you and, and we'll, we can bounce around to some of the other speakers too. Uh, so one of the things that the report focuses on, frankly, like maybe a third to a half of the entire report is the oversight regimes that are relevant uh, to the triple three, 127 ECHO and 1202 authorities. Ona spoke about the 127 ECHO reporting requirements, notice requirements, uh, and how the House and Senate Foreign Affairs and Relations Committees actually had no idea uh, that we had a 127 ECHO program in Niger, like simply were not read into it. And the Armed Services Committee in the House and, and Senate uh, were theoretically supposed to have been read into it, uh, but were uh, evidently not very aware at, at the member office level of these activities. Um, and so the report catalogs a whole array of different reporting requirements and notice re uh, notice requirements uh, that it seems like the Department of Defense is either not complying with or is under complying with. Uh, and I've actually seen a handful of triple three notifications of programs. Uh, and you can go through those notifications and pick out this is information that the law required the Department of Defense to have submitted with this notice. And that information, it, it simply isn't there, uh, such as the precise uh, partner force that we're going to be working with in a particular country. Uh, and I've spoken to a handful of people who've had access, because the number is frankly quite small, uh, access to 127 ECHO and 1202 materials. Uh, and the readout there is, is quite similar, um, which is to say what one staffer told me, you know, I'd look through these materials and I'd know that that's only half the story. You'd have to get a DOD official on the phone 
uh, to figure out actually the full extent of what these programs are trying to do uh, and, and what risks may be posed by them. Um, and, and that's again, just the, the notices and, and reports that actually are being submitted under 333, 127 ECHO and 1202. There are also these one-off reports on topics like collective self-defense uh, that the Department of Defense either does not submit or has submitted after extensive delays and being called out in congressional hearings by lawmakers. Right, so some sort of patchy engagement there. Ona, I'm wondering if you are similar, or your experience reflects that one as well, or any experiences you've had engaged with lawmakers on this issue? Yeah, I, so I'll mention one point that um, came up when I was doing a lot of interviews of mostly staffers um, in Congress who are sometimes more willing to tell you the details than, uh, than their bosses might be. Um, I did a series of interviews uh, for an article um, called Congressional Oversight of Modern Warfare, um, where we, among the various programs that we talk about, are these partner operation programs. And we tried to get a sense of, like, you know, do you feel like you're getting the information that you need to be able to provide proper oversight of these programs? And, you know, where are the gaps? And one of the big things that jumped out at me was not only the fact that the reporting may be inadequate in the way that Catherine suggested, you know, there's certain requirements that are not always being met. But one of the challenges is that um, th the reporting is happening to different committees. You know, so you have um, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and House Foreign Affairs Committee on the one hand, they have the Armed Services Committees, and then you have the Intelligence Committees. And different um, programs are being reported to different committees. And very rarely do you have information sharing across these committees or people read into various programs. And so they don't necessarily know what all is going on. We may have different kinds of programs all in the same country and members of Congress and their staff don't necessarily know what all is happening um, or the full contours of it. And certainly the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and House Foreign Affairs Committee who are in theory responsible for war powers, um, and they're the ones that get the war powers reports, they don't know hardly anything about what's going on when it comes to these partnered operations because the reporting generally doesn't go to them. And so there is this problem not only of inadequate reporting and oversight by Congress, but even when there is adequate reporting, the kind of left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And there's not enough conversation within Congress or sharing of information partially because of um, limitations on sharing that information due to classification rules. So, so there's a whole management issue here just at the congressional level that, that I think um, comes out when you talk to staffers who are involved in this. Right, so the process is contributing to some of that obfuscation of these, of these programs. Wes, I, you've obviously been at the forefront of exposing some of these programs or at least looking into them. Uh, your experience with uh, engaging with lawmakers who I'm sure, as we mentioned, were surprised by some of the things that you've discovered. Uh, Wes, I think you're, uh, you might be muted. Yeah, I would say in some cases that's the case. I, I, I've also met with lawmakers and congressional staffers who, um, you know, it's typically committee staffers or staffers for, you know, the chairman or ranking member who are much more, much more read in and much more on top of things uh, and heard from the sort of the special operations perspective of special operations headquarters that kind of when they deal with that subset of, uh, of, of, committee staffers who you might call it call the, the haves versus the have nots in the context of you know the hask and sask um you know staffing worlds uh that they get actually you know pretty intense questioning and and, and oversight and so on um from the from that sort of from that small red in subset of the of the relevant committee um you know Una just met, said something about secrecy and i think that's i mean from my perspective that's really the the thing here um, I'm not convinced that with Section Triple Three there are major problems, uh, or that Triple Three is in need of my in need of reform. I mean, from my perspective, that stuff is pretty out in the open. It's pretty above board. The problem uh, that's associated with it is the use of this supposed collective self-defense, uh, sometimes in cases where there's no real basis um, for for collective self-defense. You know, this sort of amb ambiguous concept um, to be used. You know, Section One Twenty Seven Echo and Section Twelve O Two are a different story because they are so heavily classified. Um, and I think that there is uh, really a, a pretty substantial problem there uh, where not all parts of the executive branch, not all parts of DOD are operating off the same understanding and assumption about what kinds of programs and forces these authorities are used to fund. Um, and in fact, you know, even, even up at OSD or up at, at SOCOM, I think the nature of special operations is that you're dealing with small distributed teams 
Uh, you're dealing with um, different special operations units that may kind of, from DC, they may all look the same. Uh, but in reality, the culture of the Navy SEALs is very different from the culture of the Marine Raiders. It's very different from the culture of the Green Berets. Uh, and the cultures of different special forces groups among the Green Berets vary significantly. And all of these things affect what they actually do on the ground. Uh, and there, there are a ton of nuances that simply are not going to make it up into, into sort of officially mandated reporting it, until something goes wrong, as it did in Tongo Tongo, when there had been, you know, a case of mission creep. Um, you know, part of this, this misunderstanding that how difficult it is for DOD to wrap its own mind around uh, what these programs are being used for is because there's quite a variety to it. Um, you know, what 127 Echo was used for in Iraq and Afghanistan is very different from when it was used in AFRICOM and, uh, and some other parts of CENTCOM, for instance. Um, uh, but, you know, there's more to the problem than that kind of diversity and region specific nature of the types of surrogate programs. Um, you know, I've often found that the higher up in the chain of command you go, um, you can, the less is understood about what special operations forces actually are using 127 Echo programs for at kind of a granular on the ground basis. You can sometimes get pretty high up Pentagon officials who don't really grasp the type of operations the surrogates are conducting. And I've had on more than one occasion found pretty senior Pentagon officials who interact with Congress about 127 Echo, who themselves do not understand kind of some of the basic lingo, like what the word surrogate entails in, in the special operations context, um, et cetera. Um, so that's obviously a problem. And I think one of the things that is at root of it is this very high classification surrounding the programs. Um, you know, that classification also obviously presents obstacles to public understanding and even congressional understanding of 127 Echo and hence 1202 as well. Um, but, you know, I wanted to uh, just sort of highlight, um, you know, there are a lot of causes for mission creep for how, uh, you know, for how how, how a program can kind of go south from a program that's used for one for one purpose to a program that's used for for another purpose. But I think classific over classification contributes to that. Uh, it contributes to programs that originally existed for kind of a narrow mandate uh, to take on a, a really a broader mandate without it ever being really reflect reflected in official reporting. Um, I also I do think that um, you know sort of the modest public information that exists about 127 Echo programs, um, including you know my, my own reporting, has created some misconceptions about how 1202 is used. Um, you know because of the fact that 1202 is based on 127 Echo, um, but in fact is used for for very different types uh, types of missions. Um, you know, and how do you fix all this? I think the tempting answer would be, oh, just declassify everything, right? Classify 127 Echo and 1202 programs at the much lower level that triple three partner operations are classified at. And I think that, that would clear up a lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings uh, and perhaps address some of this mission creep and things like that. But unfortunately, it's not, I mean, it's it's not that easy. I mean, and this may be strange to hear from someone who has reported on these programs and plans to continue to do so. You know, I'm starting a book that's going to be about surrogate force operations and, you know, the history of their use uh, over the past 20 years. Uh, but I think there are some genuine differences between surrogate and partner forces that present real problems with that kind of transparency. Um, you know, from DOD's perspective, uh, I don't think that these programs are classified so much with an eye toward keeping them from the American public. It's much more about the host governments that want these programs, often want them quite badly and advocate for them, but that believe that their existence would be controversial in their own domestic politics in their country, that an opposition party that doesn't have to deal with the reality of fighting a serious insurgency would use them as a cudgel, saying that, uh, you know, the, the, the party in power is uh, is giving up sovereignty, is sort of you know, loaning out military units for 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 the United States to use. I mean, that's one issue. Another issue that I think is quite real and serious in some cases is security of members of the surrogate units and the possibility that they that being identified as surrogates rather than partners would put them at their families at more serious risk of being targeted in their homes, not on the battlefield uh, by insurgent groups. Uh, because, you know, as we saw during uh, during the collapse in Afghanistan, I mean, the CIA's surrogates, which were a very well-known force in Afghanistan, um, uh, the Taliban made very clear to them that they were not subject to the amnesty uh, that uh, the military's partners were going to be U.S. military's partners in the Afghan National Army, Afghan National Police were going to be subject to. Um, you know, 127 Echo Forces potentially fall into that same category where they may be at risk for much, much greater and more severe, more long lasting kind of retribution from enemy and insurgent forces um, if it is known that they were surrogates rather than partners. Um, and, you know, so far, I mean, you know, some, some of these programs have come out, um, others have not, um, but there's sort of how sense, how, how serious of a concern that is, I think varies um, 
from place to place. And, is, and it is certainly something, you know, the kind of practical implication that we have to think about when we think about declassifying the identities of surrogate units or, or revealing the identities of surrogate units in my case. And that doesn't mean necessarily that you shouldn't do it or the benefits don't outweigh the risks, um, but it's just the kind of thing that you need to, to look at with open eyes um, and not wave away as it can sometimes be very easy to do from, you know, from thousands of miles away. Well, that's great, Wes. And I think you touched uh, briefly on, on some of the reforms. I wonder if, if under, in under a minute, uh, Catherine and, and Anna, um, if we could each get from you where you think some of these reforms can get started. Um, just a, a reminder to the audience, we'll be turning to Q&A just after this. So please uh, feel free to submit your questions directly in those chats. Uh, but Catherine, just a couple of thoughts from you on, on where reform should start. Uh, I think that the reforms need to start not only with oversight, but also with reining in the substance of some of these authorities to make sure that they can't be used for extensive uh, or, frankly, at times abusive uh, implications of unit self-defense or, or collective self-defense. Uh, and so one of those things, for instance, could be saying, OK, if you're just doing a non-operational train and equip, do not allow uh, U.S. forces to co-locate with their partners who are actively engaged in hostilities against local adversaries, uh, or don't allow 127 ECHO and 1202 programs to be based on expansive notions of constitutional self-defense, only on statutory authorities that Congress itself has enacted and arguably has more control over. Ona? Great. Well, I agree with all of that. Um, I would add, I think the international law that I mentioned before, we have the kind of bare outlines of it, but it's an area where there needs to be a lot more development of the law in this space. Um, and I think that international lawyers and U.S. lawyers uh, could aid and assist in providing kind of filling in this rule of state responsibility and common article one. The U.S. has actually resisted the ICRC's efforts to fully develop Common Article One, and I think that that's a mistake. I think we should play more of a role in, in helping to kind of lay out the boundaries of what kinds of responsibilities should states have when they're partnering with other forces. And on the domestic side, the one thing I'll add, in addition to what both Wes and Catherine said, which I agree with, is that I do think Congress could solve a lot of these problems by doing a better job of sharing information internally. I think they tend to be very engaged in these kind of turf wars um, and not as interested as they should be in kind of sharing information with one another so that they can more effectively provide oversight. Um, and so kind of trying to escape some of these silos by providing information across these committees, by setting up working groups. You have to remember that the executive branch deals with this problem by having a national security council. It has the heads of each of these agencies get together on a very regular basis and their deputies on a very regular basis to talk about these things across agencies because you can't talk about them in silos and actually understand what's going on. Congress doesn't have anything like that and it really ought to. Well, that's fantastic. And we have some great questions from the chat that I'm gonna to turn to in a second. But uh, for those who are seeking uh, CLE credit for this event, uh, now is your moment. Please record the following code on your affirmation sheets in order to uh, verify your attendance. The, the CLE code, um, as you'll see appearing on your screen, is WTTX4X. Uh, and to keep with the military theme, that's Whiskey Tango Tango X Ray for X Ray. And one last time, WTTX4X. So uh, hopefully you've took, taken that down. It should have been uh, coming across your screen just a second ago. Uh, but I'm very excited to turn to the Q&A. We have some great questions. I think the first one is uh, really useful. It's sort of forward looking. Uh, we've talked a lot about how we've seen some of these programs um, manifest themselves uh, over the course of the last several years. But looking forward, I'd be curious, you know, we're, we're dealing with a new context, obviously uh, a changing thematic focus on the part of the U.S. government, uh, a changing uh, national security strategy. So looking forward, I'm, I'm curious, uh, or this audience member is curious, uh, where you see these programs going? Are we likely to see more use of these authorities and uh, possibly the implications for the 1202 authority that you talked about, Catherine? Uh, maybe I can start with you, Catherine, on that first question. I do think that this is going to be one of the dominant modes of operating uh, or, or working, to, uh, working in the counterterrorism space. Uh, as the Department of Defense starts to pivot more toward great power competition with China in particular, uh, that doesn't mean that uh, concerns at the Department of Defense about 
you know, terrorism are going to disappear. Uh, but what it does mean is that there's going to be less public appetite uh, for, you know, large ground wars, large deployments of U.S. forces. And the Department of Defense absolutely does look at these uh, partnered operations as a low cost, low visibility uh, way that's not particularly salient uh, to continue, you know, the the low simmer of, of conflict. Uh, to keep going after adversaries across Africa, various parts of Asia. Um, I think with respect to great power competition itself, uh, the Department of Defense is seeking to not only codify 1202, but also, also substantively enlarge in it and enlarge in the budget for it. Uh, that effort this past year through the National Defense Authorization Act for 2023 failed. Uh, but, you know, I would not be surprised at all if the Department of Defense didn't come back to Congress next year and say, please, please codify this authority, give us more money for 1202 uh, so that we can use it against Russia and China. Um, so, yeah. Well, Wes, you, you obviously have a lot of experience talking with DOD officials about these programs. I'm curious what your perspectives are and what you've heard about their forward looking view on these programs. Yeah, I mean, there's been a, if you look at public testimony from, you know, the, the generals who go up to, to the Hask and Sask and talk about these things, I mean, there's a pretty steady drumbeat of um, thank you for giving us this authority. Thank you for enlarging it last year. Uh, we've used it all. Please enlarge it further this year. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, I really don't foresee um, a, a circumstance where there becomes less demand signal from the military for, for 127 Echo money. I mean, it is, you know, as um, as Catherine was noting, I mean, essentially, these are these are the alternative. This is this is this is how you can get stuff done without sending in a strike force of young army rangers who potentially get hurt and killed. Right. Um, the, the, it, it, this is how you can do stuff on the cheap in terms of American lives. Um, and uh, it probably in many ways, um, you know, how you can do stuff more effectively than by using, uh, you know, large, you know, large formations of American troops, uh, as we saw in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, you know, within special operations forces, um, some special operations forces units are not so interested in working with partners. They're not interested in this kind of stuff. They prefer to sort of pivot to uh, to training for the next to the big war with China and Russia. But many other special operations units, and particularly the Green Berets, um, I think they really prize and value these uh, the 127 Echo and 1202 authorities. And uh, they see them as, you know, if a battalion is deploying, Green Beret battalion is deploying to Europe or deploying to Africa. Yeah, and you're a young captain, you want to get that 127 Echo or 1202 mission because it's that's the one that lets you do kind of what you were trained for. Um, so I think that, I think there's a huge demand signal from uh, for them uh, from everywhere, you know, from Green Beret captains and majors uh, who are coming up and trying to make their mark um, to uh, a, a Pentagon that is interested in kind of keeping a lid on various global counterterrorism issues um, without having to uh, commit U.S. ground forces in a way that would sort of, you know, that, that, that the American public wouldn't like or, uh, or, or or might prompt a more uh, a more substantive or aggressive debate about sort of what the limits of the war on terror should be, you know, whether this particular Al-Qaeda affiliate in the Sahel really, you know, rises to the level of requiring U.S. military attention, right? Um, as, so long as it's surrogate forces that are, that are addressing that Al-Qaeda affiliate in the Sahel, maybe that debate just sort of never, uh, never happens. Great. Thanks very much. Oh, oh, no, this next question, I think, is, is really, really great for you. And uh, from our audience uh, relates to how about the U.S. being held accountable in past instances of violations here. I'd love if you could talk a little bit about um, that context, but specifically in relation to these buy with and through programs um, and what the legal implications may be for holding the United States accountable. Um, has it happened before and what the prospects of it looking uh, looking forward? I think it's a great question. Um, and uh, the audience member who asked it, I think, is really prescient. I think one of the challenges that we face here is that there isn't really a um, court with jurisdiction over these violations. Um, there's no international court that has jurisdiction to address the violations of state responsibility doctrine and the common article one. Um, and that makes it all the more important that the United States police itself. Um, because these legal violations, when they take place within the United States, when the U.S. engages in these partnered operations and those partners are engaging in humanitarian law violations, for instance, violating the Geneva Conventions, that creates a pattern that other states are watching. Other states are learning from that. And what we do, other states are going to replicate. And so 
we have to be um, really careful to hold ourselves to the highest standards in part so we don't create a, a pattern or a program that other states are going to replicate and then engage in violations of international humanitarian law themselves. So I think it's precisely because there isn't any really easy way to hold people to account for these violations internationally or even domestically um, that we have all the more reason to hold them to account through events like this, um, through uh, noticing these programs happening and calling them out and trying to encourage uh, U.S. policymakers to do more to actually abide by the rules um, because nobody else really has the power to do it. Right. So speaking of that public accountability, uh, Wes, one of the questions we have here is why don't we hear more about this in the media? Obviously, you have been uh, one of the leading, if not the leading voice on this, but you spoke a little bit about sort of the secrecy around that. Why hasn't this made a bigger splash, particularly, I mean, I think we saw in the Tonga Tonga incident, a spike, but over the last few years, we haven't heard as much about it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say we hear about it when something goes wrong. Um, you know, we, we heard about it in the aftermath of Tongo Tongo. Um, it, we're not aware of other major Tongo Tongo like events. Um, you know, if other if Americans had been killed in, in, in other surrogate operations, we would know that. We don't know when surrogate forces themselves are killed. Um, I think one reason is um, uh, simply the fact that uh, military media relations are in a much worse place than they were 10 years ago. Um, you know, the, the embedding program comes in for a lot of criticism, a lot of, uh, oh, well, this, you know, this made reporters too close to the troops, whatever. Um, but one of the huge upsides of the embedding program was it allowed journalists on the national security beat to create you know, sources under kind of intense conditions on the battlefield, um, who they then could follow for the course of their careers. Um, and, you know, without embedding in places like Somalia, Niger, um, it, it, certainly embedding of the kind that was done in the past, you just don't have that same access to go and talk to a Green Beret Master Sergeant who's, uh, you know, who's working on one thing and then, you know, follow up with them a year later about what he's working on now, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I think that's that's one example. Uh, another is it's it's a subtle distinction. It's like, you know, the difference between partner forces, proxy forces, surrogate forces um, that can make I mean, that can make, you know, that can be hard to, to interest audience in um, if there's not some really important news peg, like four Americans were killed in a, in a country that you didn't know we had American troops in. Um, it's just, especially in, in a, in a, in a world, in a media world where we have, you know, the war in Ukraine going on uh, where even sort of the, the 1202 connection to the war in Ukraine is a pretty, you know, pretty small thing relative to the, the, the enormous human drama of Ukraine. Uh, I think it's, it's hard to interest people and it's especially hard to interest people if you can't kind of get the firsthand access, to you know, go out with a Green Beret team that's doing one of these missions, which DOD won't won't permit. Um, so that's why I'm now sort of trying to take a step back and do uh, look at this from kind of a book perspective. Um, you know, try and try and now uncover stuff that over the past 20 years was not possible to find out about in, in real time. Well, Wes, you're wetting our appetite for both your article and your book, so we'll have to look forward <laughs> to that. Um, the next question, Catherine, is um, I think for you. Uh, someone is asking about the funding stream for these programs. Obviously, Congress uh, holds the purse strings, but if there is this tension between DOD and Congress, can you talk a little bit about how funding works into that? Yeah, so uh, Congress is supposed to be holding the reins on uh, appropriations for the military. Uh, one thing, though, to note about these authorities is that each one of them is notionally a funding authority. Um, and so they provide the money uh, one of the things that makes this so challenging too for lawmakers who aren't properly read into these programs is that in congressional testimony, uh, if it looks like a lawmaker is pressing harder and, and very interested in 127 ECHO or 1202, it's very easy for the DOD official giving testimony to say, well, these aren't concerning authorities, they're not authorizations, they're just funding authorities. Uh, to try to deflect criticism and, and maybe obscure some of the risks. Um, and so the, the funding is is actually from the authorities themselves. Absolutely got it. Um, this last question, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna break into two parts. Um, it, it, someone's asking about the nature of the control that the US exerts over its surrogate forces. Um, Wes, I'd love if you can maybe just be a little more granular on what that actually looks like. I mean, is that a commander somewhere? Is that does that imply a certain proximity. And then, Ona, I wonder if you could talk a little about what that means um, for U.S. liability, if the scaling nature of control uh, shifts the nature of culpability 
for when things go wrong, hypothetically speaking? Uh, sure. So maybe I'll um, try to give a couple examples of you know how we're aware of 127 echo programs, how they worked uh, in a couple of cases. But you just have to uh, have to understand first that these are snapshots; they're they're little glimpses, uh, and that not every 127 echo program looks the same as every other one. And in fact, you know the agreement between the host government and the DoD is different in 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 every case. Um, but so an example would be in. Um, uh, well, so, so there basically are two broad models for how this control works. Um, one broad model is uh, you have U.S. Special Operations Forces who are on the ground in some region, say uh, Puntland in Somalia. They've got a you know, team of guys there, they used to, um, and they have an irregular force um, that uh, is not part of the government of Somalia, um, and it pays is paid by these U.S. SOF and answers only to those U.S. SOF. Uh, and they, the U.S. soft, they may, they're not nominally commanders, but in effect, they are the only authority that the Puntland Security Force, for instance, um, you know, answered to. Uh, and so it's, you know, pretty, pretty intense degree of control that they're exerting over that force. And they're sending it out, they're picking its targets. Um, they may not be, you know, calling every shot on the battlefield. They may not be moving, you know, maneuvering first squad to this direction and second squad to that direction. That they may have some, a, a competent surrogate commander who's doing that. Um, but, but they are picking the missions. Um, they are choosing what they're sent out to do. Um, the other, the other type of, uh, you know, control arrangement that's a little, that's more complicated um, is you know, when you have uh, forces that are essentially th that are that are part of a formal host nation um, security force, uh, but that it's basically where you have U.S. special operations forces pay and exercise a more limited form of control over a military or paramilitary unit of a host government's existing standing formal security forces via one of these agreements. Um, you know, examples of that would be the Expeditionary Force of Niger, the one that was involved peripherally in Tongo Tongo. Um, and, you know, there are many other examples of this. Um, but basically, these are ones where, you know, the control, it's sort of harder to define the control. Um, because it's, you know, they're not an irregular force that answers only to the U.S. commandos. Um, they, are, they are still part of their host nation's government. Um, the host nation military still exercises sort of most types of administrative control over these troops and their assignments and so on. Um, but they are sort of loaned or rented uh, out to this U.S. soft team um, to use for particular missions. Go out on this raid, go out on this reconnaissance mission and collect this type of information about this, you know, about who's moving along this road. Um, and then, you know, in, in the eyes of many of the advisors, pay is really important to this. The fact that you are paying those surrogates, this, this you know, often pretty substantial U.S. stipend relative to their, their base pay in their, in their host nation security forces, that's kind of how you know they're going to follow your orders. Um, because even if you don't have the authority to promote people or, or court martial them or anything like that, which you don't, um, you do have the authority to kick them out of the program, say they're no longer someone we want in the program, and you know, they lose their access to that pay. Ona, and, and what are the implications very briefly, maybe legally, about that shifting scale of control? Yeah, really briefly. I mean, the short version is the more control, the more legal responsibility. Um, so the more that U.S. forces exert control, the more they can be held responsible for those that they're ordering around um, or assisting um, do. But what we want to be careful about is we don't want DOD to take the wrong lesson from that because you don't want them to just say, hand weapons and, and, and you know, a mission and sort of send people forth. Um, you want them to actually provide training about international humanitarian law obligations and ensure that certain kinds of basic uh, protections are observed. And this is where better developing the law around uh, use of partner forces could be really helpful. Like what kinds of um, training programs might provide a safe harbor from legal responsibility. That's kind of a space that we'd need to develop the mo law more fully. But right now, the short version is the more you're involved, the more control you have, the more responsible you are. Um, and so these programs, particularly where we have surrogates, um, we're really responsible for what they do. And we should be careful about what we allow them to do as a result. That's a great uh, last bit there. I'm going to wrap up here with just one final question for each of you. And I know how difficult it is, but in under 30 seconds, for example, I wonder if each of you could give me one thing you want our viewers to walk away with after, um, after this conversation. Catherine, I'll start with you. Um, I, I think the important takeaway is that Congress needs to enact holistic security cooperation reform if it's going to reassert its constitutional role in deciding when, where, and against whom the United States is at war. 
Um, I'm personally confident that that can be done on a bipartisan basis because I know that there are lawmakers on both sides of the aisle who care about the rule of law and who know the risks of undemocratic and unaccountable military adventurism. Uh, Ona, what, what, what would your takeaway be for this? But the one thing I want viewers to walk away with is that legal rules for regulating the use of military force are sorely in need of an update. Warfare has transformed radically in the last 50 years, as we've heard, um, and it's way past time for Congress to reclaim its constitutional role in deciding when the United States is going to war. And Wes? Um, I think my you know, thing to take away would be um, the degree of diversity that exists in these programs. Um, you know, just be aware when you read about uh, something that happened in Niger that that's not necessarily representative of how other programs are being run uh, in other places. And similarly, if you read about a very innocuous sounding program uh, in, in, in another country, that doesn't mean uh, that all of, the, all of the sister programs are, are, are run in the same way. Um, and I think one of the things that this, um, it, and even when they are one run responsibly and successfully, I think uh, 127 ECHO programs in particular, um, they kind of serve a function of making it easy to forget about the war on terror, right? Mm -hmm. To forget that it's still out there chugging along, um, to forget that sort of its geographical limits and its limits in terms of kind of what groups um, are, are covered under its auspices are still remain very, very large. Um, and then, you know, they serve to... Uh, I think to kind of limit the debate about that, um, the debate about well, you know, how how, how does does just any old Al Qaeda or ISIS affiliate warrant U.S. military attention, or should or do we have to have you know real knowledge that they that they pose a a genuine threat to the United States? Yeah, thanks, Wes. A really good reminder to close us out. Uh, I learned a lot and I studied these issues, so thank you very much uh, to our audience, to our our moderators. You can learn more about the issues we discuss in the report. Um, that the Brenner Center just uh, just released, Secret War. If you have any questions about the CLE code, please let us know by emailing CLE at Brennan Center or Brennan.law at NYU.edu. Uh, and you can access the information form in the chat. Again, uh, it's been a pleasure having you all here. Thank you very much and have a great rest of your day.